Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the first person-to-person -person meeting since March of 2020. I am... I'm Candace Robertson and president of the 2021 POA board. Okay, sorry. Um, I am Candace Robertson and president of the 2021 POA board, and I'd like to start by introducing our board. Uh, Bob Latill and... Uh, as secretary and Amy Truppenbaum as treasurer have been kind enough to uh, escort and queue people into the seats. I don't, they're in the back if they, um, they'll be up here shortly. Uh, Regis Falinski is also on the board. And then Bob Crouch is on the board and he is past president of the board for three different terms. Um, and then, last. And here come Amy and Bob. Just wave your... <laughs> uh, and last but not least, uh, Scott Auer, a general manager, will be speaking. Okay. Uh, before I get started on introductions, I'd just like to go over uh, our tentative meeting schedule for the remainder of the year. In August, September, and hopefully November, the board will have a meet and greet um, at the clubhouse on Thursday before the week of the scheduled board meetings starting at 5 o'clock. So you'll have an opportunity to talk to the board members one-on-one -on -one and any other subjects that you'd like. In October, we have a community coffee with presentations by the board candidates at the clubhouse, and that date's yet to be determined. And then in December, we'll have our end-of-the-year town hall meeting um, uh, on the 4th. The regularly scheduled monthly board meetings for the remainder of the year will be on Zoom and be recorded. Um, our agenda this morning um, includes um, an introduction, then the presenting of the 2021 President's Award, followed by the introduction of the three candidates who are running for the two positions open for the 2022 board. Then uh, there will be a presentation by Regis Falinski and Rich McLeod on the strategic planning initiative. Uh, Regis will follow up with an update on BJL. And then Scott will review the status of the dams, the financials, uh, the clubhouse and amenities, and rules enforcement. Um, as we come out of the COVID months from March 2020 to May 21, our community is returning to normal. We just enjoyed a successful 4th of July that marked our return to community-wide events with record-breaking attendance. And just before that, we saw the resurfacing of the clay tennis courts, the introduction of the package porch, and the opening of the new bocce ball courts. And soon, will uh, the indoor tennis courts will be reopening at the Wellness Center following renovations. All of these have been completed on budget. And then later this summer, the new basketball courts at Wildcat Recreation Area will be completed. And finally, in early first quarter next year, the redesigned and renovated Creek Golf Course will be opening. To date, this is also on budget with construction completion expected within the next month. Also worth noting is the clubhouse is partnering with the Bear Society for the return of monthly live shows through November, like last night's performance at the veranda through November, or excuse me, I said that through November, and other fun events. And there's also the revival of the weekly Sunday brunch starting tomorrow. As many of you have closely followed, Lake Disharon should be reopening in within the next week. And in conclusion, we have responsive leadership and an established strong financial foundation, which has allowed us to effectively address the most pressing current issues with plans for capital projects over the next two to seven years um, to address our infrastructure requirements for our 50-year-old community. We look forward to the results of the Voice of the Community Survey, which is part of the strategic planning project that you will hear more about this morning which will help us guide us uh, in selecting the order and magnitude of some of these projects. As you will hear shortly from Scott, we'll also be working on multiple projects in the coming months, and we are very fortunate 
to have a professional engineer as our new director of capital markets, capital projects, excuse me, who has been on board since April to spearhead these. Once known as the Volunteer of the Year Award, the name of the recognition has changed, but the honor remains the same. The award is now known as the President's Award and is given to an individual volunteer who's made a significant impact or contribution to Big Canoe. The success of Big Canoe depends on the contribution of property owners serving on the committees and working with community groups and organizations. And each year, the POA honors an outstanding individual for recognition. Our recipient this year is perhaps immediately known around the community as a regular of the acoustic showcase lineup, something you might not associate with a guy who spent 40 odd years as an information technology executive. You've probably heard him at one of the showcases. He's been known to break out a Beatles favorite now and then, and he's also one of the voices of Inside Gates Radio. There, he DJs a program specializing in San Francisco music scene of the late 60s and early 70s. You usually can hear him on Sundays from 4.30 to 6.30 p.m. When he's not entertaining us or hitting the golf ball, he's been actively involved with the Big Canoe Wellness Collaborative for the last six years. He was instrumental in getting the operation started in November of 2015 and has served the last several years as the board president. Conceived as a way to help Big Canoe residents stay in Big Canoe longer, this nonprofit organization provides invaluable non-emergency and non-medical services, including meals, rides, visits, and referrals to the residents of Big Canoe. He leads the team that oversees strategic planning, budget development and management, board development, volunteer management, fundraising, and numerous other areas. One measure of the difference that this organization is making to our community is the fact that over 1,700 services have been provided to Big Canoe residents since the operations began. Before that, he was a board president for Literacy, Literacy Volunteers of Atlanta, which provides one-on-one -on -one literacy edu tutoring to adults in the Atlanta area. Volunteerism has been a focal point part of his life since he and his wife, Kat, moved to Big Canoe in 2004. There are many ways he continues to enhance the community we all love, not to mention an impressive track record for trivia nights at the club. For all that and more, I'm del delighted to present Shiraz Alkan with a 2021 award given to an individual who has made a significant impact or contribution to Big Canoe. Shiraz. Thanks very much. Well, thanks for that response, too. I really appreciate it. Um, I'm really humbled and honored by this award. Uh, volunteerism is uh, so valued here in Big Canoe. That's one of the many nice things about Big Canoe. And um, I really admire and respect the people who've been recipients of this award previously. Um, and I know there's so many volunteers out there doing such good work, including the folks on the POA board. Um, first and foremost, though, I want to thank my wonderful wife, Kat, for her love and support. Uh, she's my love, my partner, my best friend. And in, things like this always mean so much more when I can share them with her. Um, I also, I'm going to be accepting this award on behalf of all of the volunteers of the Wellness Collaborative. By the way, if you need to find out more about it, bcwell.org. But um, there's so many great volunteers. They're dedicated. They're caring people. Uh, it's been wonderful to work with uh, colleagues like that. And uh, as Candace mentioned, some of the impact that we've had in the community, we're really proud of that, too. Um, one of the, the things we say in, in our mission is that we're neighbors helping neighbors. And in a period of time where it feels like there's some conflict and, and issues uh, that are going on, neighbors helping neighbors seems like a good place to start. Thank you.
last item on my agenda for the introduction is uh, to introduce the three candidates who will be running for two open positions for the 2022 board. Um, if each candidate will just stand briefly when I call your name, I'd appreciate it. Um, Jill Fillman. Okay, thank you. Elton Gogolin. And Tim Moran. Thank you. Um, they'll have the opportunity in October with um, a community coffee and also a wine and cheese event later in, in the month to uh, present um, their, uh, their thoughts and why they're running. Um, each candidate will also have uh, an opportunity to deliver their message via video on the website and will also have several opportunities in uh, Inside the Gates e-blasts. Now I'm delighted to turn the program over to Regis Flinsky and Rich McLeod. Okay, I think it's working. Well, it's good to be here this morning. Good to see you all here in person. Uh, it's, it's really a, a, a really welcome change to be looking at all your smiling or maybe not smiling faces instead of a computer screen. But in any event, I am, as Candy introduced me, Regis Falensky. I'm a 10-year uh, resident of Big Canoe, and this is my second of three years on the board. And before I get into talking about strategic planning, I just want to pile on Shiraz there. Uh, you know, Candy mentioned his, uh, he'll do, break out into a Beatles song. I think he does a great Neil Young cover. That is, <laughs> I was blown away the first time I heard the man, but Shiraz is a very, very talented man, and we have a lot of talented people in Big Canoe. And what's really, uh, really the great thing about this is so many of the talented people like Shiraz and maybe some others that haven't gotten the rec recognition yet, is they're willing to donate uh, their talents to the betterment of our entire community. So Shiraz, thanks much. thank you very much, buddy. Now, on to the business of strategic planning. We'll stay here. Okay, um, as some of you may know, for the last paying job I had, I was uh, responsible for strategic planning for a uh, major division of a Fortune 500 aerospace company. So I've seen firsthand how uh, valuable of a tool, uh, well thought out and executed strategic plan can be to an organization. So where are we at with strategic planning in Big Canoe? Well, we do have a strategic plan, and at least some people know about it, but unfortunately not very many. Uh, if you remember your last property owner surveys, you would remember the question, I know what the strategic plan is and it is clearly communicated to me. Well, in 2020, we had, uh, that scored 4.9 out of 10. In 2021, it inched up a bit to 5.4 out of 10, which is still a fail. Uh, it ranked 36th lowest out of a total of 37 questions. In case you're wondering, number 37 was something about the master plan, but that's subject for a, a different day. So, as the tagline says here, an effective strategic plan, and this is the, one of the key here, understood by all stakeholders, is vital to any well-managed organization. So the next question some of you may be asking is, well, what is a strategic plan and why is it important? Well, I'm gonna address the why is it important part first. And I will uh, talk to that by uh, citing two pretty well-known phrases, cliches, if you will. Number one, 
is if you don't know where you're going, any road will take you there. In other words, you need a goal. The second phrase is a goal without a plan to achieve it is a wish. So you not only need a strategic plan, but you need to be able to execute the strategic plan or, uh, and put it, what we used to call deployment, deploy this. So getting back to what a strategic plan is, it will articulate the purpose of an organization, what, what our mission is, why we exist. It'll also talk about a vision statement, which is the goal, what we aspire to be. There's high level objecti objectives that will support realizing this vision or goal. And then it needs to be flowed down to various departments, to all departments, amenities, and they need to develop operating plans that support the high level strategic objectives, which in turn support the, the overall vision or goal of the organization. Now being in strategic planning, I like to talk in charts or diagrams. So if you can see this, this is kind of a high-level uh, view of the strategic uh, planning process. At the very top, you'll see the box that says voice of the community, and uh, Candace referred to that a little bit earlier. What the, if we are developing a goal for Big Canoe, in order for this to be done properly, we need the input of all Big Canoe property owners in order to develop a proper goal, to make sure it reflects what you, the primary stakeholders in our organization, feel what, it, uh, what we need to be. So that is the vision statement. You've also got the strategic objectives, and then as I said before, it flows down into the various operating department and there should be departmental or amenity plans, annual work plans, five-year action plans, which in turn flow down to manager goals and objectives. Top left, you can see it gets from, it starts with at a high level strategy and flows down to day-to-day -day tactics. Now, what's the difference between the two? Well, you can say a strategy is something like, everybody's heard it, are we a resort or are we a community? Well, that's kind of a strategic question. So when that answers, it helps drive decisions or tactics like, let's say, setting amenity fees, that uh, those kind of decisions are made by operations on a day-to-day -day basis in support of the vision of Big Canoe. If you also look at this, the voice of the community, uh, excuse me, if you look at on the top right hand, the arrows, above the red line, it's kind of the responsibility of the board or the, and the strategic planning committee, which we'll talk about in a little bit. As it gets down into the deployment or execution of the plan, it becomes the, the uh, responsibility of operations. So where are we? Well, as I said before, strategic plan, the Big Canoe does have a strategic plan. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, it was developed in 2015, and uh, it was updated in 2018. I'm not going, it's, we have mission, we have a vision, we have values. I'm not going to read all these. Anyone that's interested, we can provide, this is on the website, we can provide a link to it. If... Uh, you know, I think if you would contact Tim Moran, if you want to, um, if you want to look at this in, in some more detail, but I will read the vision, which is to be the preeminent private mountain community in the southeast, recognized for providing an extraordinarily friendly and enriching lifestyle. Not bad. I, you know, I, I don't think that misses the mark by much. It may be a little bit ambiguous. But uh, Rich McLeod is going to uh, talk about that a little bit later on. So we do, that is our goal. That is the goal of our Big Canoe organization. Now, when you look at our, uh, 
our strategic plan as it currently exists, we have a mission statement, we've got a vision, we've got values, we have strategic objectives. So what's missing, as far as I know, we did not attempt to solicit the property owner input, in other words, the voice of the community, when we developed our vision. That is very important, and that is something that we hope to correct or we, we hope to address in uh, our current strategic planning initiative. Also, again, to the best of my knowledge, there's very little been done with the exception of we do have a master plan, but there's been very little done in terms of attempting to flow down these objectives, our goal to the organization, which is a critical part of strategic planning, the most important part. Again, we have a goal, so we know where we're going. We don't have a plan to get there. So what are we doing about this? Well, we have formed a strategic plan. There is a, uh, we have formed a strategic planning uh, committee. It is chaired by Rich McLeod. There he is. Uh, I didn't want to do his part of his, the presentation, so I was just checking to make sure he was still there. But, it, <laughs> but anyway, it is, uh, um, we have nine members, 11 members, all very talented property owners who have devoted and uh, very experienced in business, uh, in nonprofits, in uh, financial sector, all are very active in, uh, and are very concerned about the future direction of Big Canoe, and they have volunteered their time and talents to help us with this. So, okay, right there, it's 10 members. It is a diverse group based on age, property owner status, time in Big Canoe. So we've got people that have been here less than uh, two years. We have people that have been here 20 years. We have relatively young people, uh, in their 50s, and we've got, oh. <laughs> like I said, it's, like I said, it, it is relative. And then we've got old guys like me and David Sharp. <laughs> David, David isn't here, so. But anyway, he's a good friend of mine. Um, yeah, he was. He was. <laughs> okay, so this is a temporary committee. We're going to provide the deliverables and then disband. So to talk more about the details, how we make the sausage, I'm going to turn it over to Rich McLeod, who's a, um, who is the uh, chairman, chairperson of the uh, strategic planning uh, initiative. Rich? Thank you, Regis. I was going to jump out the back and avoid this, but then you'd have to listen to him for the rest of it, so I decided I wouldn't do that. Uh, my name is Rich McLeod. Uh, we've been full-time residents here for three and a half years. Uh, we live in Audubon Ridge, and we're retired, and we love Big Canoe. Um, I spent most of my career in the chemical industry, and I ran a global business unit, and our company took strategic planning really seriously, and I've seen how strategic planning can really transform an organization in a positive way, and I've also seen where it can be done not very well. And uh, so it's kind of a passion of mine. And um, uh, so when we moved here and, and saw what was going on in, in Big Canoe, um, I, I just questioned really what our strategic plan was. And I learned that we do have a strategic plan. And, and it's really not bad, but there's certainly room for improvement. There's always, always room, room for improvement. Um, so we formed this uh, strategic planning committee. And uh, with very specific deliverables, and because I didn't want to work on a committee for the rest of my life, I said, we can do this, but there's got to be an end to it. So we're a temporary committee. And we have three deliverables that we're to provide. Um, one is to update the vision statement. And I'll talk a little bit about the vision statement in a minute. But we want to update that, and we want to make sure that it's really based on input from everybody in the community. One of the problems that I saw with a committee is we can get 10 people together to create a vision statement, 
but it's going to be full of prejudice, it's going to be full of bias of what those 10 people uh, want. As hard as we might try to get a really diverse group of people in the community to serve on this committee, it's still going to be full of bias. We really need to get the whole community involved. The second thing is to develop those high-level initiatives that, um, that we just talked about. And then third is to develop the planning tools, the templates for the operating people to do strategic plans the same way. So we're very consistent in the way we do it. And maybe more importantly, that every year we're doing it the same way, and every year we're doing it, and every year we're communicating it. Because as you could see in the survey, we've had a strategic plan, but we can do a lot better job on communicating it, both within the operating people that work for Scott and within the community. So those are the three deliverables. Do a vision statement, come up with the strategic initiatives, and put the tools together for people to do strategic planning in a very professional way. So that's our objectives. Um, so the first thing is the vision statement. And as we've said over and over again, we want to get the whole community involved. So the first thing we did was we formed this strategic planning committee. We asked for volunteers, hoping that we'd get maybe a half a dozen people to say they would serve. And we got 41 people that said, I'd like to serve in this. I'm like, holy cow. So we had, we, what we said was we want to get diversity. We want to get age diversity. We want to get people that have rental properties and people that don't. We want people that are old and young. And um, we, we selected 10 people, but the people that were not selected are still going to be an ad hoc committee for us because they're talented and they're capable. And as we get into the project, we will use them uh, for various steps of the, uh, of the initiative. Then we decided we needed to hire a consultant to help us with the voice of the community. We need somebody, uh, we need a professional. And if, if I was in your shoes, I'd say, oh, geez, we need to hire another consultant. Why can't we just do it ourselves? If we have all this talent, why do we need to hire a, an outside consultant? Well, in, in my career, I was in the chemical industry, like I said, for most of my career. I took a, an early retirement and went to work for a company called Strategex, which by the name you might understand deals with strategic planning and strategy. And one of the things that, that we uh, understood very well is you can go out and ask people a bunch of questions. It's not what you ask, it's how you ask it that really makes a difference as to whether you get the really unbiased good results. And it's virtually impossible for a group of people with a vested interest to really objectively ask not only the right questions, but ask them the right way. And so there are consultants out there that specialize in asking the right questions the right way and then analyzing them to give you the results that you want. And if we're going to do strategic planning in Big Canoe, we need to do it right the first time. We need to do it professionally. So we sent out uh, requests for proposals for a variety of different consultants that specialize in this. And we've chosen a company in Chicago called T4 Associates. They're very good at what they do. For those of you that might be in the business world, there's a, there's a, 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 a way to measure the success of, of what you're doing called the Net Promoter Score. And it's where they do surveys and they say, if you were going to uh, recommend this company to somebody, what's the likelihood that you would do that? And they get a net promoter score of whether they would promote you or not. So these guys are very analytical. It's very science-based, very statistics-based. And we really don't have those capabilities amongst our own community to be unbiased and be as professional. So we hired, um, we've hired T4 Associates. Um, they will give us that independence and that non-bias that we need. And uh, here's the process that they're going through. First of all, they've already met with the Strategic Planning Committee, with Scott's operating people, and with the POA board, kind of as a, um, uh, a focus group, to ask them a bunch of questions so they understand our community very well. The next step is we've identified about 35 people that they're going to call on the telephone for a 30 to 40 minute interview where they can ask a variety of questions and ask those, quest those same questions a variety of different ways to really understand in depth. So they're going to go a deep dive into these questions with these 35 people that we've selected. And again, the selection of those people has been based on a broad cross section of the community. Um, Based on those, the responses of that, and by the way, they're starting that this coming Monday, so they'll start calling. We'll be getting the transcripts of those uh, telephone conversations. 
And then they're going to do a community-wide um, web-based uh, questionnaire. And we've spent about a month working on just the types of strategic questions we want them to ask. So we said, this is what we want to understand. You guys figure out, because you're the experts, how to ask those questions. So that community-wide web-based uh, survey will go out sometime um, in August, maybe even by the end of this month, I'm not sure. Um, and so we're asking everybody in the community to please respond. The more input we get, the better our vision statement is going to end up being. So, um, Then the Strategic Planning Committee will get together, and based on the feedback from the community, we're going to craft, we're going to develop a new vision statement. And that vision statement um, will be presented to the community for comment. So it's not like we're going to say, okay, we got this figured out, here's the, the vision statement. We're going to come back to the community and say, this is what we think the vision ought to be, please give us your comments. And um, uh, in September we'll do that where we'll have an open forum like this where people can comment on the vision statement. Because that vision statement is then going to drive the rest of the strategic plan. Um, then we'll develop the high-level uh, uh, strategic objectives, and we're that's another thing that T4 Associates is going to do for us. We're, we're going to sit around and say, okay, based on the voice of the community and based on our vision statement, what is the um, uh, major high-level strategic objectives that we want to accomplish? And T4 will be in those meetings to, in order to coach us, in order to make sure that we understand they, they're going to coach us through to make sure that we don't get off track, I guess is the best way to put it. And then we'll take those uh, high-level objectives and we'll uh, present those to the POA board and the general manager for their, their comments, communicate it to the community again for their comments, and then finally we'll develop or, or publish our vision statement and our high-level objectives uh, in order to do the, uh, the final strategic plans. Okay. And then again, we're going to develop the... Uh, the templates in order to do the strategic plans. So we're not, we, the committee, are not going to do the strategic plans. We're developing the process and the templates for the different amenity managers and the different asset managers to do the strategic plans that will be rolled up. Uh, we'll do some training uh, with the amenity managers in October and November, and then by December they should uh, be able to complete their uh, annual operating plans that are all in alignment with the strategy with where we want to go long term. Okay, and uh, so afterwards, if you have any questions on the strategic plan, when we get to the Q&A, uh, we we'll welcome any, any thoughts or questions that you have. And with that, I'm going to give it back to Regis. Thank you very much, Rich. Well, I'm the board member that uh, drew the short straw, so I'm going to be talking about the Bobby Jones Lynx uh, contract, which is, you know, I do get out and about in the community quite a bit, and I do get a lot of input or feedback from property owners as to the Bobby Jones contract. So we're going to be talking about that today, and I should say Bobby Jones contract restructuring. Okay, so the current contract, uh, it was signed in May of 2020. Not going to go into a lot of detail, but it was a three-year agreement uh, broken into one-year terms. The fee was $15,000 per month, plus there was provisions for a bonus. Now, my recollection is the bonus, the total bonus that could be earned would have been $30,000. I think we paid them out something less than 15 in a bonus. And they, the scope of this contract was pretty wide. They had complete responsibility for the management of Big Canoe. They didn't have any employees uh, for reasons that had nothing to do with Bobby Jones. It more had to do with our benefit programs. None of the employees uh, reported to Bobby Jones, um, although our director of amenities, uh, Robert Sabat, is a Bobby Jones employee. Um, so where are we now? Well, looking back, We've had some successes with Bobby Jones. Uh, as a board member, I can certainly appreciate the improvement in the quality of financial information that we get, that we use to make uh, base decisions on. So that's been a plus. 
uh, they have made innovative recommendations to reduce employee benefit costs. Any of you in business understand what a what tremendous escalation we have seen any that has been experienced in cost for uh, health and hospitalization insurance, so on and so forth. So they've done some things that have helped us. They've come up with some ideas we're still working through that hopefully we can realize even greater savings. They've made a significant improvement in food and beverage financial performance. Uh, that is something Scott will be talking about in greater detail, but um, we're glad to say that the days of the three-quarter million dollar loss in F&B seem to be in our rearview mirror. And one of the other things that, you know, again, I haven't done any kind of survey, but it's my own personal impression and feedback I get from property owners. I think the quality and consistency of the food in the clubhouse has improved. Okay, that's the, that's, that's the good, good news. The bad news is the property owner dining experience still falls well short of expectations. And maybe I should say clubhouse experience instead of dining experience because it's broader than the, just the dining. Uh, don't, again, don't want to go into details about that. I understand there was a big blow up on Facebook this, this last week that's kind of symptomatic of this. So where do we go from here? Well, we th we're quite confident, we being the board, Scott, and Bobby Jones, we feel we know what needs to be done to fix this, and we also feel that Bobby Jones is part of the solution. So we've restructured this contract. It is now a six-month contract going from July 1st to the end of the year. There are no obligations on our part or on Bobby Jones's part to extend this contract beyond that. The fee has been reduced. Over the last six months of this year, we're going to be paying them $7,900 a month instead of $15,000 a month. There is no provision for a bonus. We are limiting the scope of their responsibility. We no longer consider this to be a management contract but they are going to focus on the clubhouse, primarily the, the clubhouse experience or the property owner experience in the clubhouse, not to give away some of the gains that we've made in improving the financials, but to do both, to keep the majority of those gains, to keep operating more efficiently, but do so without having such a significant impact on the property owner's use of that, of our facility. Uh, and that's, they will also be continuing to provide financial advice and consultation. So that's basically it in a nutshell. As Rich has said, uh, we will be doing a question and answer session at the conclusion of the planned presentations, and we will be, uh, Happy to answer any questions about this agreement if uh, they should arise. So thank you very much for your time and uh, attention, and it is my great pleasure to vacate this stage and turn it over to Scott. Thank you. Well done. Good morning, everybody. It's really, really nice to see you. It's been kind of a fun morning because people that I've been talking to on email for like a year when they walk up, you're like, I didn't know that's what you looked like. And nobody really knows how to react to that question when you say that. It's like, well, was that a compliment or not? I don't really know. Um, the other thing, thank you to the chapel. This is, um, this is one of the most beautiful, special buildings I think we have in Big Canoe. And it's always a privilege to be here. So thank you very much for letting us use this great place. So nobody told me when I applied for the GM job that an engineering background would be helpful. Um, however, luckily, I happen to have that somewhere in my life, and it's been rather helpful. Uh, as many of you know, this has been the year of the dams. And I should also start by saying we asked all of you to send uh, questions, topics, things that you all wanted to talk about. And if, um, 
if, if there were a lot of questions about a topic, those are one of the three or four things that I'll talk about first. And then, like we said, we'll do lots of uh, Q&As later. So if I missed something, yeah, you can certainly ask then. So let's start with Lake Disharoon Dam. And this is what it's supposed to look like today, last week, 4th of July. Uh, this is not what it's looked like this summer. Up in the upper right, you have Trina's grandkids there. Um, they will be uh, doing rules enforcement from now on uh, in the future. I'm bringing them on board next year because Trina needs some help. But, and she's not here today, and she didn't know that I was going to say that. All right, March 30th, 2021, very bad day in my life. I literally am sitting in my office with, with our new director of capital projects, and Debbie rushes in. It's never good when Debbie rushes in with a phone on her hand. And it's Jason Brunell on the phone, and that's usually not good when you pair those two things together. Um, this is called a sluice gate. And normally you don't see much of this. Uh, there's a little bit that normally uh, pokes out of the top of the water, and it's a big tower. It's about 52 feet high, and you crank a crank, and it raises and lowers a gate, and that's how you drain Lake Disharoon if you ever need to do that. Uh, where the arrow is is where water's supposed to go down into the gate. On March 30th, what was happening is there was a whirlpool on the other side of the tower that wasn't supposed to be there. And these little logs that you see from trees are floating around that whirlpool, which is probably why there was a whirlpool. So this, uh, you may remember March. March was about four and a half inches of rain in two days. We had drained the lake to take care of some dredging for Creek 9 and to get rid of some old structures that were rotted out in the lake. We got the four and a half inches of rain and about three days later, this is what was happening. It was honestly such a unbelievable mess the first day, March 31st or April 1st, whatever that would be, and it wasn't April, April Fools. Uh, when we went out there, you had 50 years of silt and muck. We couldn't even walk into the basin. The guys, we, we don't, you know, you've seen all the restaurants. We have, you know, we have heroes working here and things like that. We didn't put up any signs, but y'all got heroes working here. So they're not in the room today. So guys like Jacob Van Zant, your director of public works, and, and Jason Brunell, who's our operations director, they waded into this mess and tried to figure out what in the world are we going to do. The first guy we had out to look at fixing the pipe actually turned around and said, I'm not even going to bid on the job. It, it was such a mess. He came back a week later. It looked a lot more like this because of Jason and Jacob. He bid on the job, and he's the guy that actually basically saved our bacon. So um, our guys did an amazing job. They had to build a coffer dam up there to, to hold the water back so we could get down to where the tower was. They had to build roads. They had to bring in tons of gravel. Um, they had to put all those pump lines and stuff in place. I mean, just amazing activity had to go on to get us to the point where we could even fix the problem. And this is an example of how you fix a problem with a 50-year-old corrugated metal pipe that runs through the middle of your dam that's about 250 feet long that you can't see. Uh, the gentleman here is the one who uh, won the contract. They're an expert in slip lining pipes. And what you do when you slip line a pipe is you take that very heavy, thick, high-density polyethylene pipe you've fuse it together in sections, and you pull it through your old corrugated metal pipe, which is where the leak was. And then you put all those little nice white pipes around it, and in the last picture, you inject under incredibly high pressure concrete grout that fills up the entire void inside the dam and makes sure for the next 50 or 100 years, you've got a really good pipe to work with. And that way you don't care what happens to the rest of the corrugated metal pipe, which, you know, shouldn't have been there after 50 years anyway. So this is where we were about a week ago. 
uh, new gravel to fix the front edge of the dam where the water had been swirling around. Uh, we encased the little part of the pipe that comes out of the dam. We encased that all in concrete, which I wish the builder developer had done in 1972 because then those little logs you saw circling wouldn't have punched a hole in our pipe, which is basically what happened. So that's all been encased in concrete. And this is where we were yesterday afternoon. With... Happy, happy picture, believe me. Um, it, it, and of course, what we've learned is anytime you're trying to fix a pipe or pour concrete, it rains. So we've had the wettest like two months while, you know, once we got the contractor, got the materials and things, it's just been raining constantly. So anyhow, it slowed us down quite a bit. But um, we should, by this time next week, the beach should look fairly beautiful. There won't be any pipes on it. There won't be any hoses. There won't be any, any pumps. There should be inflatables. The rock slide's been cleaned. The rock slide's been recoded. And crazy people should be sliding down there again. So, yes, thank you. Let's see here. Whoops. Not going forward, guys. All of a sudden. There we go. So are we done at this point? And I wish I could say the answer is yes, but unfortunately the answer is no. And there's, let's see here. Bink, there we go. Two more problems that we have to deal with. This is called the um, swim dock. I think of it as the canoe launch that goes uh, right by the beach club. You can see um, you shouldn't have bowed walls on a retaining wall going out into a lake. That's not a good sign either. You've got rotted timbers there and you've got old surfaces. That, that swim dock is part of our 50-year-old infrastructure. That was always in the capital budget. It was always planned to come out. It still needs to come out. So we are working through our whole capital um, policy and procedure to get that replaced later this fall. We have to take the lake down a bit again. We won't have to drain the lake the whole way, but we'll have to get it down like 12 feet, I think, to replace that. The other thing, and by the way, everything we do now, we're trying to do, whether the vision statement is 100% right that comes out of the strategic planning committee, I think you'd all be uh, in agreement. We want this community to look good. We want it to be preeminent. We want to be proud of where we live. So anything we fix, we're fixing the right way, and we're fixing to last for 50 more years, and we're fixing to look really good. So that's what that old beat-up stock will turn into. It'll turn into what we call the beach extension because it'll be a brand new seawall along there. The sand will come along from the beach all the way over to the rock slide. You have two floating docks coming off the side and you'll have canoe launches because right now when you get in a canoe, it's kind of crazy and scary when you're at the beach club. So we're going to fix that with canoe launches. So that is in our plans for later this fall. That's what this time next year, that's what it's going to look like. And last but not least, um, that is Creek 3, which has got, it's supposed to be water between the T and the green, and it's kind of like an island right now, which isn't good. That's where all the silt went from Lake Disharoon when we had four and a half inches of rain followed by two and a half inches of rain followed by 1.6 inches of rain. That's where it all ended up. So we're going to have to dredge that. Uh, we have a plan to do that. That'll be late this fall. And it will generate a huge amount of material. And where do we put that huge amount of material? Some of it might go into a community garden that we're working through. Some of it will be held in reserve for future projects. And some of it will go along the shoulders of our roads where we always knew we wanted to put more soil to help hold the edge. In, in some of our roads are getting a little scary with big drop-offs on them because they've been paved a few times. So some of that silt will end up on our roads. So that's coming too. So we have another dam, a much bigger dam. This is the one that we were worrying about and thinking about and planning for when that one happened. So this is the class one dam. It's one of the largest, not there's, there's folklore that it's the biggest dam, or it's not, but it's pretty big. Um, and we pay an awful lot of attention to it since I got here last year. So, um, 
there's a few things we're doing here. So just so you can see, this is what it looks like from the top. And when you ride along Wolf Scratch, over to the right, there's that interesting little waterfall thing that comes through the woods. That's the spillway. So that is the way that Lake Pettit's level gets controlled. The water comes down the spillway. At the bottom of the lake, uh, or of the dam, there is something called a lower level outlet. That is similar to that corrugated metal pipe we just talked about in purpose. It's totally different in construction. It's reinforced concrete. It's a 36 inch round conduit. We've inspected the whole thing. It goes through the base of the dam and there's a gate about 100 feet down in the water on the other side. That's really there to be used for lowering the level of the lake if you need to do some maintenance or if you saw some developing conditions. It's not meant for like a rapid, uh, you know, uh, draw down half the lake or something. It would take about two weeks to draw down about two thirds of the volume of, of Lake Pettit, which is something we would never ever want to do. But that is what that gate is. And there's an area which we'll talk about in a second called seepage. You may have seen some of that uh, rhetoric on Facebook. That seepage has been there since 1979. And like I said, it's nice to have an engineering degree. Believe it or not, dams, including concrete dams, have water moving through them. They're supposed to have water moving through them. We all think of like a dam when we're a kid. You know, you build the wall and water shouldn't come in. Actually, earthen dams especially have water moving through them all the time. It's okay to have water moving through them. What you don't want to have is the water carrying dirt with it. That's a bad thing. So although that seepage has been there since 1979, it's always clear. We drain it off to the side. We inspect it every quarter with professionals. But we want to do something about that, so we'll talk about it. And then riprap goes along. For any of you who have been on boats or fishing, there's lots of stone that goes along the shore, just like at Lake Lanier or something keeps your uh, erosion down on the, face of the, on the upstream face of the dam. So... So this is uh, us and Georgia Safe Dams. And you may have figured out by now, not everything you see on Facebook is right. Um, so actually, this is kind of like Finding Nemo, Fisher Friends. Georgia Safe Dams is our friend. We like Georgia Safe Dams. They like us very much, actually. They're constantly saying, I wish all of our other dams that we dealt with were first of all paid attention to, second of all you answer our phone when, when we call, third of all you guys are being so proactive, you've hired one of the best engineering um, dam people you know, in the country, if not the world. Um, so we like Georgia Safe Dams and they like us. So we've had a couple really uh, great conversations in the last two weeks. You may remember we did a town hall on Zoom. Uh, unfortunately, back in, back in February, we took you all through the whole plan for Lake Pettit. We've now taken Georgia Safe Dams through the whole plan for Pettit, and they've come back and asked some questions, and we've responded, and what we're, what we're settling on, what we're gonna do, looks something like this. So in late fall 2021, there's about three things we wanna do, none of which require a permit from Georgia Safe Dams, but they all think is a great idea. So we think it's a good idea, Georgia Safe Dams thinks it's good, and our engineering company thinks it's good. Uh, on the left is where the, the uh, seepage is. What you do is you build a little drain in the face of that, and it's basically called a sand blanket drain. Fancy word for it allows the water to pass through, but it keeps any soil particles in the dam where you want them to be. So even though it's been that way since 1979, it'd be better that it's not there. So let's go ahead and fix that. So we're going to fix it. The riprap along the shore hasn't been replaced in many, many, many years. Uh, we're going to put some more riprap because there is wave action. There's a lot of wind, as you may know. Uh, Tom Durbin has seen me trying to pilot a boat into the dock in terrible windstorm and going sideways. Um, there's a lot of wind that comes across Pettit, so we want to make sure we have riprap there. And last but not least, that, that spillway that we talked about, it's old too. 
And uh, it's been a while since there's been water taken out of the spillway, so we can totally inspect it and repair any concrete voids or wear or erosion or anything like that. We're going to do that this fall too. So those three things happen in Pettit for the fall. And then we dive into the future. And you're like, why is there a diver in Big Canoe? I don't know. A couple years ago, I wouldn't have thought there was a diver in Big Canoe. The reason we had a diver in Big Canoe is to inspect that lower level outlet I talked about. It's 100 feet down. To dive 100 feet down, you need a pressure suit and you need a decompression chamber. So having a gate that we can't see that's 50 years old, that's at the bottom of a dam that requires a diver. I, I don't know, but I, I'm just like, I think we can do better than that for the future. So, so here's kind of what we're uh, going to do going forward. So first of all, let's see if I can get that to pop up there. The master plan for the dam all of which Georgia Safe Dams will actually be permitting for us, and that will be happening early next spring, is basically a three-year plan, 2021 to 2024. We're going to replace the spillway. So right now, we'll make sure it's okay. We'll make sure that we fix any surface things we see or anything like that. But on our list for a long time at Big Canoe has been we know that someday the spillway needs to be replaced. It is the main thing that controls the water coming from the dam and, and maintaining that level in the lake. Replacing the spillway is a big project, a big design project, not something that's easily done. That will happen in late 2022 into 2023. Replacing that lower level outlet. Even though we've inspected it, we've sent divers down, we've done camera work, we've checked all that out, it's a mechanical linkage. It's, a, it's 100 feet down in water. Uh, there's much better design methods for allowing you to control the level of your lake. And Geosyntec will be designing some of that for us and we'll replace that lower level outlet and just leave it in place. So before anybody sees anything on Facebook, no, we're not gonna drain all of Lake Pettit. Our homes are not gonna fall in the lakes. The marina is not gonna crash, the, you know, all that stuff. No, we won't have to do any of those things, but we wanna make sure that there is a new spillway and that we find a different way of controlling the lake level, which will probably be a pump system, honestly, by the time we're done. Something kind of low tech, but not 100 feet down in the water. We estimate, and this is still consistent with what we told you in February, about $4 million is what Pettit will cost the POA to do all the things and get it 100% in the shape we want it to be for the next 50 years. And just in case you ask, we don't anticipate any type of bank loan for that. We do not anticipate any kind of special assessment. We have really robust cash flow modeling in place. We have really, really good cash reserves, unlike some of the communities you hear about in Florida or something like that. We are not them. We take care of this stuff. So uh, we, we can handle all of the money that I'm talking about without going out and, and getting a loan or going back to the property owners for more money or something for the dam. And that's the dam story. So we can, we can ask, you can ask more questions at the end or, or just say, oh my gosh, that's more than I ever wanted to know about dams. All right, clubhouse and amenities. Let's talk about this. Reed just mentioned this for a million reasons. And, and I'm sure there's people that could write a book on this. The clubhouse lost $780,000 in 2019. That was unsustainable. There's just no way that that could be allowed to continue. That's an awful lot of money. Normally, the clubhouse had run at a loss of about 400 a year. So when I got here, the thing we needed to do was really rebuild the foundation. And since you probably have now an hour later your donut has worn off, I'm going to talk about ice cream. So basically, the first thing you do when you're making an ice cream sundae is you get out the bowl. You rebuild the foundation of the, of the sundae. You build the foundation of the sundae. So we needed to do a couple things. We needed to really concentrate on front of house training. Uh, there's one of our unsung heroes every day, Jonathan, uh, who now meets us. 
He's not here. Yep. Good guy, Jonathan. Awesome person. So he is uh, really our one of our two floor managers, and he is trains every day and re meets with the staff and tells them the latest direction and what happened last night and are there any issues they need to know about and that kind of thing. Chef David. Chef David came from sort of nowhere and has done a beautiful job, I think, in the last year of keeping us afloat and coming up with really good food. And then, like Regis said, I never get complaints. It's one of the few things I don't get complaints about. I never get complaints about the quality of the food. It's always hot now. Uh, you know, it's very consistent. It didn't used to be that way in 2018 or 2019. Now, we, we know because we ate there a lot and it just it was kind of hit or miss. Um, inventory control was a bit of a mess, so we had huge waste. Things weren't necessarily being managed first in, first out when they came in. And we'll talk more about reservation systems, but reservations are good. It's very helpful to be able to know who's coming when, to seat people in different sections. So imagine if you're David and you're sitting there and 200 people show up at 615 that's really bad for a kitchen. That means your food quality is going to go down. It means your service times are going to go up. It means your inconsistency comes back. It means your staff goes and does a different job somewhere because they're like, this is too hectic. This is crazy. Reservations help spread out the load for the kitchen and for the servers. And so they're good to have. They're not the be-all, end-all. And we'll talk about that again in a second. And the other thing is the menu needed to be engineered. Our menus sometimes hadn't been engineered. So we often had like a dish that used one ingredient. If nobody ordered the dish, then the ingredient didn't get used, which means it probably turned into waste. So this was kind of basic, non-sexy, blocking and tackling sort of things that needed to be done in the clubhouse. And where we are now, in 2021, 2021, we have a planned loss of 359K. That's what we built in the budget versus the 780 that we talked about. And we, I think we might break 300 this year. We're doing very, very nicely financially. And I'll show you that in a, in a second. So good things are happening. Foundations built for the Sunday. We have a bowl. Where do we go now? Well, got to add the ice cream because it's not much of a Sunday with just a bowl. So even if it's cheap and not costing you a whole lot anymore, it's not too exciting. So add the ice cream. So we've already now brought back extended Sunday hours. So now you can actually have a last reservation at 6, which really means you're probably sitting there at 8 and kind of watching the sunset. So we have extended Sunday hours. Sunday brunch is back and it starts tomorrow and when i checked last night when i left we had about 150 reservations already i would encourage you uh, to get a table quickly and not have a long wait and things like that rush home and make a reservation the menu looks amazing all the waffles come back the cool egg dishes marsala something or other i don't know david's done a great job it'll be good and fun and then Nobody who went here last night is here today, right? That's probably true. No, there we go. Okay, we got a couple. So uh, Bands on the Veranda came back last night. So Suburban Road was there. And we have four dates so far planned. And Bob Mackey is working on which bands are going where and things like that. So uh, that started last night. So from what I heard from the people who were there, it was really fun and really nice to have it back. So that's pretty cool. And so then the next thing is, uh, yeah, this, this was a little crazy. So we, we, those are rooms. You, you probably all spend a bunch of time in those rooms. So whether it's the swim club or whether it's the card and club room or whether it's Mountain View room, there is no charge for property owners. There's no charge for, for if you're a registered POA organization, you just make a reservation, you get the rooms. So that is something, again, we, when we put the ice cream in the bowl, we got rid of all the charges. That was getting just a little out of hand and crazy. So anyhow, we are. this is our club, this is our community, 
you should be able to use our facilities. So um, no charge for property owners for using the room. Now, if you want to come up with a really cool decor and you want the tables all different, you want centerpieces and you want special decorations and you want you know some beautiful buffet set up or something, you work with Kristen in the clubhouse and she'll be happy to price that out for you. But the room itself, those charges are gone. So now what? Are we done? No, we're not done. Because now if you worked at Friendly's like I did when I was a kid, some people called them Jimmy's, some people called them sprinkles, but you got to add the fun stuff on top. So now we add the toppings. What are the toppings? Beautiful couple over there on the left. Who are those people? Hi, Cindy. Um, that, was, uh, that was Valentine's. Obviously, we just did 4th of July. The bands are back. Fun things. Again... What you see on Facebook is not usually correct. So I love the Bear Society. I like Bob Mackey very much. I've known him personally for years, and I think he feels the same way about me. So we just actually met the other day, he and I, and I said, Bob, take your committee, go off, come back to me in two weeks. Come back with a plan of all the stuff you'd like to do for the next 10 months. Just lay it out for me. Is it cornhole? Is it a bourbon tasting? Is it bands every single week? When is it an acoustic band? When is it a rock band? You lay all that out. And then we'll sit down and we'll figure out how to do it. Because COVID is, is at least, thank heavens, up here, COVID is mostly behind us. We have a good staff. We built the foundation. We put the ice cream in the bowl. We're ready to go back and start bringing the place back to life. So that is what Bob is going to do, and we're working hand in glove with him. And so expect a lot more cool things to be happening over at the clubhouse. I agree. Part of why we all moved here. I get it, 100%. Me too, by the way. So I, I do live here. I don't always wear this. So yeah, it's true. Um, the other thing we got to do is we need to still, as Regis was saying, service is great sometimes. Sometimes it's okay. I don't think it's usually bad, but it's, it can be better. It can be more consistent. So working more on front of house service is a key initiative that we want to get after. And... Um, Last but not least, again, a little bit of a, of a craziness thing. Again, reservations are good. They help your waitresses. They help your kitchen staff. They help us spread out the load in the restaurant. But this is our club, right? So when we walk in, we need to be able to know that someone's not going to, like, carry us out to the door and say, sorry, you didn't have a reservation. Sorry, it can't happen. The, these lovely ladies here, notice the sign behind them. It says, welcome. The other sign says, open. They will do the best they can, just like any top-notch restaurant in this area, anywhere you go down in Buckhead, you know, reservations are strongly suggested. But if you go in and say, I forgot, I didn't get it. My aunt came tonight. I, didn't, I wasn't ready with dinner. Can you seat me? The answer will be, Yes, as soon as we possibly can. Why don't you go have a drink in the bar? Thank you. Yep. Go have a drink in the bar. Sit down. Jonathan will work really hard to find a place for you. We can bring out another table if we have to. Um, you may wait a little bit, just like you would in Buckhead. You may wait a little bit, but the answer is not no. Okay, so there was a bit of confusion around that. We think we've cleared that up, and, and those four people right there get it 100%. So trust me, we've, we've had the conversation. And last but not least, you got to put a cherry on the Sunday. So because you guys got up and came here today, you get a sneak peek that no one else has seen. So one of the things we have a dire need for in Big Canoe is meeting space. We have 130 POA registered clubs, many of whom need space to spread out and play cards, bridge, things like that. Lots of POA meetings, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So a couple of things we're doing. First of all, I'm trying to make the lodge now the main place where all the POA committees and board meetings and all that kind of stuff happens because 
I'm in a lot of those meetings, and so why why sort of have empty space in the lodge when when we're not there because we took a whole group of people and used up more space someplace else. So I see that more as the place where all of the POA committee stuff happens. That frees up more space in Village Station, in the clubhouse, places like that. We have this beautiful building from the outside called the Chimneys. The chimneys is, is a perfect, perfectly sound building. It looks really cool from the outside. It looks like dirty dancing on the inside. No one has touched it since 1974. It's a time capsule. It's unbelievable. So we are working with an architect, Quo, Diedrich, and Chi. They're out of Alpharetta. They do beautiful clubhouses all over the southeast. And we're looking at repurposing the entire chimneys, not for weddings, not for banquets. You might also, you might notice there's no major kitchen in there anymore. This is for property owners. This is property owner meeting and event space. And basically the idea is you end up with six different rooms, big enough that quite honestly you could probably do acoustic showcase in here easier than you could do it at the swim club. You got dividers, you can divide things up. You've got beautiful views. We'll do a deck out the back. People probably want to hang out in those tables and have your own meetings out there. And we're going to fix the parking in front of the chimneys because you can't build this beautiful building inside and then say nobody can park. You got to walk from the post office. That doesn't really work. So we're working on all this. A new Saxena, who's your new director of capital projects, he's a professional engineer. He's working with the architects. We'll take all this to the board for a vote by the end of the year. The idea is this would be our signature construction project for our 50th anniversary, which is next year at Big Canoe. And talk about really early peaks. This is the clubhouse. So while we have this great guy here who does a lot of clubhouse design and stuff, we sat down with him and we said, here's the problem. Anytime we want to do entertainment, anytime we want to have a band, anytime we want to do like acoustic showcase, which we can't even really do over there, we run into the restaurant because everything is one half of the building. If you think about this 30,000 square foot clubhouse building, all the activity happens in a little space on the left and the entire right is usually empty. I don't know, but that's not really good space planning. So the idea is eventually we may end up doing a whole new event space, veranda and patio on that side. On the right side, which is the best view in Big Canoe, it doesn't overlook the garbage. Uh, it overlooks Creek One, which is stunning if you've seen it lately with the sod down. It's starting to look fantastic. But anyhow, all that's on the right, wraparound dining, indoor-outdoor bar, all new fixtures, use the Sconti room as the main restaurant room because guess what? That's the nicest room we have, and that's where the fireplace is, and that's where the best view is, and we never use it. That doesn't make sense to me. And then you do the other side, and that becomes a fantastic place for events and things like that. And um, you have two entrances, so people aren't always running into each other. You can have the bands going crazy on the left, and you can have Scott and Cindy having a nice romantic dinner out there in Sconti Room. So we're thinking about it. It's, it's not... Chimneys is much farther along. We're shooting for that one really next... next uh, by this time next year, I'd love to have it open. Uh, Clubhouse might be a couple years down the road, but um, we're working on it. So that's the cherry on top. All right, let's talk about amenities. In case you, uh, I think you know most of those people, the gentleman on the right who looks, uh, that's my favorite shot of him, uh, Mike Miller is our new golf pro. Um, I hear nothing but wonderful things about Mike. Mike came to us, he uh, lives in Flowery Branch with his family and has done private clubs and semi-private clubs and public golf and all kinds of different experiences which work out really well for Big Canoe. And... This is Bullet Bob. There he is. 
Um, I, I call him that because I've only played bocce twice in my life. Both times were with Bob and both times I won, which had nothing to do with me. It has to do with him. So that is our new bocce facility. Um, the, Linda is programming like crazy over there. There's rock and roll glow in the dark bocce this week, I think, coming up, which sounds pretty cool. Um, we are up to 187 bocce members. Linda's goal was 300 by the end of the year, so... New sports court, so no, we didn't take away basketball in Big Canoe. We're not doing that, no. We're moving it over on the other side by the playground so the kids don't have to run back and forth across the road and get hit by car. It's going to be right near the restrooms in the original, original bocce uh, area. We're going to start construction next week, on the, about a week and a half on that. It's a two-half court basketball group and by the way um the way we've been doing things lately which has worked out great is we get a group of people together kind of like rich and the strategic planning group we got a group of people together some some moms of young kids some diehard basketball people and we said let's work together let's define the requirements make sure you guys are all happy and then we take it out and go out to bid and follow our capital stuff and take it to the board and get the approval. But we don't just sit in a room and dream it up on our own. So this is uh, what came out of the committee, which I think is going to work terrifically in that spot. So that's coming. It'll be open by late summer. And Creek 9, which uh, this is what it looked like the other day. There's now more sod on it. So Creek 9 is doing beautifully. Just a couple fun facts for you here. Um, there's nearly nine miles of pipe. And yes, that was the same kind of pipe, really, that was under Lake Disharoon. So corrugated metal pipe that was failing all over the place, ca causing sinkholes and things like that. So nine miles of new pipe, seven miles of electrical control wire for the sprinkler systems, 300 tons of sand and peat that go into all the greens, and about 70 truckloads of sod. I know I've gotten behind two of them this week, these huge trucks filled with sod, and 390 new sprinkler heads. So it is, uh, it is moving, and it's moving very, very quickly towards completion. And so basically, Sanders, the company who's doing all the work, they're about 70% done. They hope to be finished with construction by the end of August, and then we really just move into growing. So we're now just... Lydell's out there talking to the blades of grass, nurturing them and helping them grow. But that is, uh, that's all coming. So, so far on time, on budget, it's Creek 9 should reopen next spring. Project, I think everybody, it's been really fun because Lydell had this great idea. It's like, let's go and do all these little tours on Sunday night. Well, the interesting thing is most of the people taking the tours are not golfers. And, and they're just coming, the golfers we knew were going to love this. But all the other folks are coming back and they're just like, oh my gosh, it's so beautiful. That's going to be so great. So it, it's, it's nice again, right? Even though, again, we may change the vision statement a little bit. Nice to be preeminent because we should be preeminent. So that is, uh, that's going on and that's going well. And so just, to, this, I'm going to hit you with two financial slides because that's not why we're here today. But... This is January through June revenues, because again, sometimes I hear, I don't know where I hear this, sometimes I hear that nobody's using the amenities. Can't, no, no, it's like, you know, I don't know, some rules changed or something, we can't use the amenities. Um, no, that's not it. So this is all of your amenities for 2021 versus 2019, $2.9 million dollars of revenue versus 2.8, and I don't use 2020, because 2020 is like this horrible nightmare, meaningless year that you just sort of pretend didn't happen. And so um, everything, if you look at a few of these things, golf, right? 1.2 million of revenue versus a million. <laughs> that, was, that was on 27 holes. We're doing that on 18. So honestly, if you're not a golf member, it's really, really tough to play golf here right now. But that's not going to last much longer. Um, swim is going to be low, right? And a little problem with Disharoon. So swim is going to be really low. Wellness center is going to be really, really low because of all the incredible stuff we went through with COVID. But all the memberships are coming back. So we'll be back on track. Marina has crushed it. 
racket clubs ahead. So despite the COVID things, despite the Disharoon things, we're still ahead of where we were at this point in 2019. And more fun is instead of being 212 in the red in 2019, we're now 146 in the good in 2021, which is really nice. Because what's good about that is it gives us cash to do some of all these other things that, that, that we've been talking about here. And again, even that positive is still with the wellness center being, you know, way off because of the COVID things and especially the poor swim amenities. Steve just is having like the worst year of his life, but we'll, uh, we'll get it back. And so now let's talk about one more key topic that certainly has been probably the most emails I've seen on any one topic since I've been here, and that's about renting and rules. So first, let me start with a picture. This is the Big Canoe Covenants from October 9th, 1972. So yes, we're almost 50 years old. Yes, you're going to have a really good time next year because Susan Wilson is doing all kinds of awesome, fun things for the 50th anniversary. It starts on New Year's Eve, and it goes all year. So next year is going to be really fun. Also, we'll have a lake all year, which is good. Um, covenants, by definition, are a lot like the U.S. Constitution. They are incredibly hard to change. On purpose. So when you form your, if you're ever going to build your own community and get your own covenants and file them with the state of Georgia, it's done on purpose so it becomes almost impossible to change them later without a lot of property owner momentum. So when people write emails saying, well, why didn't the board just change this? Or why why don't they get rid of short-term rentals? Or why? First of all, it's kind of cool. The board actually doesn't have that power. You know who has that power? We, we have that power because it would require a vote and the vote would need to be two-thirds of all eligible votes, which is a huge number. It's like about 4,000. Two-thirds of all eligible votes would have to vote yes to make any changes to those covenants. So also, I would be honest with you, although I get emails from people that are like, oh, please change the renters. That's really bad. I get other emails from people saying, no, 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 I moved here because I rented a place. It's good to be able to rent a place. So part of why Rich is doing what he's doing is we really need to capture the voice of the community. It's not just, hey, three people on the first tee told me they didn't like this. It's what do 5,000 people think about our existing covenants and structure. So that's going to come out of the strategic planning process. So you sit there and say, Scott, what does that mean? Oh my gosh, we're not going to be able to do anything. We're paralyzed. That's not true. And the reason that's not true is we have a whole bunch of rules and regulations. And the kind of things that I hear all the time are too much noise, people speeding, uh, you know, way too much. Somebody had a boom box on the, in the hot tub last night. I couldn't hear the cicadas. Um, I swear I almost ran over two people on wilderness today that just waved very nicely, man. I'm like, oh no, this is bad. I mean, they're just, there are two people out there and they're walking on wilderness. They're having a lovely day. And it's like, you can't walk here. This is not a good idea. So those are the things that I see. And like I said, we have lots of rules and regulations. So what are we doing about that? First of all, we brought back staffing 24-7 in the North Gate. Okay? Now, I would honestly tell you, if somebody said, you know, how many people go through the North Gate, ba 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 ba, you know, whatever, it, it, it takes a chunk of our POA money to do that. However, we believed, and, and the board supported, we believed that part of why we moved here as property owners was we wanted to feel safe. So even though there might only be eight or nine people coming through the gate at three in the morning, if it's the wrong eight or nine people, I want somebody there to know about it. So that's why the gates are back. So that actually just happened two weeks ago. Second of all, this was Tim Moran's idea. It was great. You know, we always said, hey, the people renting the homes, they need to get the rules and regulations out to people. No way to know that that ever happened. 
some, some management companies are really good. Other management companies, not so much. So we took on the task and we said, hey, when you come through the gate and we check you in, we can know whether you're visiting here as my son, for example, on a permanent guest list, or are you renting a property? If you're renting a property, we now give you this delightful little packet out of which we've done 3350 of them to date this year. And they show you where to eat. They show you where the garbage is. And not that 30-page thing of rules and regulations, but one sheet, just one sheet, top 10 things you need to know about David Letterman, right? Top 10 things you need to know about Big Canoe. And maybe you'll, you'll take a look at it that night or, or your wife will read it while you're trying to find out where Sconti Ridge is or something like that and say, you know, we're not allowed to do this. So that's a simple thing that we've done. The other thing, and, and we fought pretty, pretty hard for this in the budget this year, we added a fourth full-time public safety officer. So, uh, good also, I agree. Thank you, thank you. Um, basically, the idea was that um, both from a fire safety point of view, if you have a fire and you have two people in the house, OSHA regulations really want two people out of the house in case one of them gets hurt and you've got to go in after them. But the other thing it does is it allows Ricky to actually go back to, and I guess Big Canoe did this long before I got here, um, proactive patrols. So we've now made offers to, we have to actually hire three people to get one 24-hour person. So that's why it's not that easy of a snap decision. Oh yeah, just go do that. I mean, it's a big chunk of change. Um, but again, we thought it was the right thing to do for our community. So those guys are being hired now. Ricky's putting a schedule together. You'll start to see more proactive enforcement of our rules, proactive patrolling. And around the speeding, we uh, put in our capital budget um, a speeding trailer that not just flashes up a sign, and that's not it yet because it's coming in, I think, this week, but it actually reads the license plate and actually communicates with public safety so that we can generate the fine letter. Kind of nice. And basically, yeah, and say, hey, guys, you know, sorry, that was 45 in a 25 zone. So uh, we're going to start enforcing a lot more speeding, and the trailer definitely helps that. The other thing I would tell you is, and, and public safety and I, I started with the board a few weeks ago, and public safety and I talked about it this week. There's been, um, I don't know, sort of a, maybe an over lenient view with enforcement. And quite frankly, to me as your GM, I don't care whether you're a renter. I don't care whether you're the son of a property owner. I don't care whether, you know, you're, I don't, all I care is you're a person and you're not obeying the rules. And I don't have to worry any harder about that. So what I need you all to do is the way the process works in Big Canoe. If there is noise, if there is 15 cars parked out on your street, if there are two cars in your next door neighbor's driveway and you know your next door neighbor's in Florida, you call public safety. We, we certainly in 88 miles of roads and 2,700 and increasing homes, we, we can't be everywhere. So you guys are a bit of our, of, of our eyes and ears. I guarantee you that Public safety will respond. I also guarantee you that now public safety will keep track of how many infringements have happened at that house. The clock doesn't start over the next weekend. The clock is cumulative. So if you've got a house where weekend after weekend after weekend there's problems, the property owner of that house is going to start getting fined. So the fines... Mm -hmm. The fines go to the property owner, not the rental management company or whatever. Now, if I'm a property owner and you give me three fines, I might look to say, do I have the right management company? I might have a conversation with my manager about that. But the property owner in our covenants and our rules and regulations is responsible for the guests and the behavior of their guests in Big Canoe. So we're going to really dial up the enforcement because I think over the years, it's been a little like, oh, well, you know, I, that person means well. You know, yeah, I know, but it, it, it's gotten so, Big Canoe's so big, we have so many guests, 
we, we, you got to remove that, that judgment factor. It's kind of black or white. All right. And last but not least, um, lots of people say, well, wait a minute, Scott. You know, I saw something advertised on VRBO, and it's got like 22 guests are allowed to be there or something. So here's, here's the deal. The two, and this is good for everybody to know because there's probably people in here who rent their houses. It's fine. It's okay. Um, but the counties now have said you get two people per bedroom plus two. So if in the county records your house is a three-bedroom house, you get to advertise eight people to rent. That's it. And the counties tell us that they've instituted a lot of new rules and regulations. They want their sales tax money. They want a $250 a year fee for refiling paperwork. If you're going to rent, you need to go talk to Dawson or you need to go talk to Pickens. And they're also going to start looking for things like, wait a minute, why is that house 21 people and we've got it as a three-bedroom house? That's a septic violation. So it's kind of interesting because that's not our role. We are not the eyes and ears and enforcement of the county. We pay taxes for that. Um, but we are working with them to say, what are you guys doing? What are your rules? How do we help you communicate them to Big Canoe? And, um, you know, we uh, will do our part to help with your enforcement. So um, the, the counties are stepping up a bit. So that's more to come on that, but that's coming. And then the last thing I had to talk about was respect. And Shiraz said it very well, right, about neighbors. So people ask me all the time, what have you been surprised about? You lived here, Scott, for two years. Then you've got the honor of being general manager. What have you been surprised about? And I would tell you that the thing I've been the most disappointed about is the tonality in the community and maybe it's a U.S. thing. Maybe it's a COVID thing. I'm not smart enough to know that. I'm really not. But your staff in the clubhouse especially works really, really hard to make sure that they're doing all the, the best they can. And sometimes 200 people do show up all at once. And my wife Cindy sent me a thing in the New York Times the other day. Restaurants are closing to have a be nice to employee day because their employees in restaurants are just getting so much crap all the time. It's just terrible. And these are restaurant owners. They're like, we don't know what happened. We've been doing this for 20 years. What's going on? So I would just ask you to treat people the way you would want to be treated, whether that's our staff, whether that's your neighbors, whether that's me. If you got a question, I'll answer it. I promise I will. You use ask the POA. I spend about 45 minutes a day answering questions, and I'll tell you what I know. But it's nicer when you say, hey, Scott, I have a question. Not, Wah! don't need to do that. I'm going to answer you anyway. It's just, I like you better if you just ask me nicely. That's okay. I'll answer you faster if you ask me nicer. But no, seriously, our, um, our, our staff, you know, people are just like, well, Scott, you, you got to enforce it. And I'm like, I do, believe me, I'm, I'm not shy. Um, I do when I know about it. But if you're a waitress here and somebody's actually um, harassed you, and I won't tell you what I know people do, but harassed you, many times they're not going to go to Jonathan. They're embarrassed. They're not going to talk about that. And, and many times Jonathan may, may say, well, I'll go to Scott. And the lady will say, no, 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 don't, don't, don't do that. I got to see this guy again next week. He's going to be, he's in here every Wednesday. So they don't often push it. If I find out about it, I'll push it. So I need you guys to help. And so basically the best thing in the world is peer pressure. This is your home. This is your club. This is your restaurant. This is your amenities. If you see people acting out, I would certainly appreciate you guys sort of taking the initiative to say, that's not how we do it in Big Canoe. That's not cool by me. And the MGA has come to me, and they're like, Scott, how can we help? Our members, we don't want to tolerate that. You, you, you're not in the MGA and act that way. You know, that's, that's great. And I've had a few other organizations lately, the same thing, saying, how can we help? 
So I just want you to know, I will enforce it if I know about it, but I need, you know, you guys to enforce it as it happens. It's really, really important. So I think that's all I had. Thank you. Bob. Thank you very much. And uh, as being uh, on the relative high end of the age spectrum that Regis was talking about, uh, I'm completing my eighth year on the POA board over a couple spans of time. And I've developed a perspective of some things that I think are important. I've got a brief and focused message. In the nearly 50 year history of Big Canoe, uh, the developer was the uh, controller of the POA for more than 30 years, significantly more than 30 years. Uh, in that time, one of their objectives, obviously, was to keep assessments down, to keep home sale prices attractive uh, and assessments attractive. That was a good strategy for them. It was a good strategy for Big Canoe, possibly, at that time. But it wasn't a good strategy for the long-term health and the financial a well-being of Big Canoe. Uh, Scott has mentioned a lot of things that we're, we're planning to, to be done. Uh, we had an emergency with Disharoo and we had to, had to find funds for uh, the, uh, the, the big dam we're going to do something about. We're thinking about the clubhouse, the chimneys, some of those kinds of things. Now, those things didn't get to the, we didn't get to the point where we can think about those and fund those things by accident. So in 2005, the developer started the, the transition from uh, developer-controlled POA to the board-controlled POA. Since that time, there have been several steps that have been taken. Sometimes those steps, uh, there was a misstep and they had to be taken a couple of times to get it right. But one of the things that we did was in 2010, the community passed a uh, ordinance, a covenants change that allowed for the funding of a restricted capital reserve fund. That fund is, it was funded, uh, currently has $2.8 million in it, uh, has never been tapped, but is always available for an emergency. Uh, and that is one of the things that we have that helps our financial uh, strength. Another step that was taken was a $25 uh, capital component to our, our annual assessment uh, that generates uh, close to $1 million a year uh, in, in capital funds uh, that can be used for the projects that we're talking about. And just recently, we passed the capital contribution fee, uh, which is now uh, in four years of, of full, uh, four months, I'm sorry, of full implementation. Uh, it is uh, contributing over $60,000 a month. So you can see we're getting significant cash uh, into our coffers that we can use to fund these projects. And as Scott mentioned, we have a cash flow model that can be done to do modeling to say what is most important and what are the effects of that and, and what we can get done. Uh, we also have people besides funds that are doing uh, excellent work in support of, of our uh, financial strength. We have a uh, organization, Scott has a financial organization that's doing a very excellent job. We have a, a very strong uh, property owner volunteer finance committee. Uh, we have an active uh, audit and risk committee and all of that has led to strong financials and a clean audit for every year. And if anybody has any questions about any kind of details about what I'm talking about, take a look at the video of the June board meeting and you can see all of the details of these funds and uh, uh, what the uh, auditor's report was and uh, their opinion of, of the committees and the strength of the committees and what we have working for us. Speaking of that, um, we have in Big Canoe property owner volunteers and employees that make our life what it is a pleasant experience every day. 
Uh, we've mentioned some of those today. We recognize Shiraz as the creme, creme de la creme of volunteerism. And Shiraz mentioned all of the other volunteers. And the Wellness Center is very important. Um, the Trails Committee, we don't see what they do very often, but we experience the results of what they do on a daily basis. Uh, the AECC and AECD, uh, again, we don't see their hard work and what they do to make this place well, but we look around us and we, we have consistency in our controls and they look very, very nice. A Black Bear Society that, that Scott mentioned helps our, our experiences. We have uh, not had a chance in 18, nearly 18 months to have a face-to-face -face meeting, and I know you are all looking forward to a face-to-face -face meeting, and we're going to continue those, as Candace said, make uh, board members available on, on Thursdays each, each month for the rest of the year. But let's please join me in honoring, respecting, uh, showing our appreciation for the volunteers and the employees of, of, of Big Canoe uh, now that we've got a couple hundred people together that can show that. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this old historian for a couple of minutes. Um, that concludes our, our presentations for the day. I'll now turn the mic over to Tim Moran, who will manage the, the Q&A. Tim, it's all yours. Thank you, Bob. All right, Scott, we're going to give you this mic. Q&A now, and uh, we have the room until noon. It, oh boy. We might go a little bit over. A little bit over. We're going to have um, Amy on the left side here with a mic, and Bob, Bob's going to be on the left. Amy's going to be on the right. We're going to try to go to everybody as they, in the order they raise their hand. We may have to switch back and forth from side to side uh, in order to give them a chance to give you the mic. Uh, please, um, everyone ask one question. We'll get through everyone with a question, and then we can do follow-ups. Let me see if I've got anything else here. Okay, and we're going to go over a little bit on the noon meeting. So let's just get started, and anyone with a question, please raise your hand. Okay, we've got two up front here, one for Bob and one for Amy. Okay, Bob got there first. Yes, sir. Keep your mic closely. I, I've got a big voice. I can get around that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, actually, good afternoon. My name is Jim McKechnie, lot 5536. The question that I have is on the terraces. There has been some uh, information on Facebook, and I know that's a dirty word. Sorry, Scott. Um, but uh, about them paying uh, their amenities, uh, and they're paying their full share. Uh, are they using uh, having transponders? Uh, what is what is the real scoop on people coming from the villages? Okay, who who? Uh... The villages at Blackwell Creek. It's, it's supposed to be automated. Oh, am I on? Okay, the way it works for the villages at Blackwell Creek, everybody knows what I'm talking about, right? Um, it works for them the same way it would work for anyone here. You can put anyone's name on a deed that you feel like putting on a deed. <laughs> um, your son, your mother-in-law, anybody. And that is what the developer at, I'm going to call it the villages, but I'm not talking about Florida. Um, <laughs> a little different. Um, anybody can do that. So... The person that's developed the villages has a lot, perhaps two, I'm not sure, here in Big Canoe, and they add people's names to that. Now, that is not to be entered into lightly because you have tree ordinances, you have um, property taxes, not much, but you have strings that are attached when you do that. Um, the way Big Canoe makes it right 
for the property owners is that you can only have two, let's see if I can get this out right, primary amenity members in any household. That doesn't mean two spouse. It means like two brothers and their entire families and can be uh, can access our amenities without paying something extra. Once you get into more than two, which is the situation for the villages, you have to pay an amount that is equal to what it would be if you owned a lot. Let's let that sink in for a minute. Anytime, oh, if you want to access big canoe amenities. So everybody that lives in villages, I'm sorry, but the villages, um, that wants to access Big Canoe has to pay us as though they owned a lot. Okay? As an assessment. Yeah, you know, right now, that's $198 a month if you just own a lot. Did that answer the question? It almost answered the question because they get they get a lot assessment, but they own a house in the villages, so do they also pay for the uh, uh, the house fee? No, because the villages is not within the covenants and property lines of what we call mother canoe. So no, no, we don't get a dwelling fee. Now I will tell you that the lot fee is roughly two-thirds of what a dwelling fee is anyway. So not that much more. But no, they don't. Yeah, because they're paying as though they own a lot. <coughs> same, it's the same. But again, people who add names to their deeds, you better think about that twice because what do you do? We've got 25 people in your deed. Somebody passes away. You've got issues, folks, going down the line. So it's really just not to be entered into lightly. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And that's been going on for time immemorial. You know, you just buy a lot in here, uh, buildable or unbuildable, and you pay the fee and you have uh, total access as though you owned the biggest house in Big Canoe. It doesn't matter. You're all treated the same. Uh, let me think about that. Is Ernie here? You, you have to own a lot here to be able to put guests on a guest list. So they can't bring in guests. Right. Now, someone said they have, some people have bought a lot over here that live over there, but you can't add, you don't have an account in Dwelling Life if you don't own a lot. Okay. Okay, Amy, you had the next question next to you. Yeah. Hi. Um, Joyce Daniels, uh, we live on McElroy. Uh, I want to go back to the temporary committee, and um, I understand that you're working with volunteers and, and dependent upon that, and I may be wrong because I don't know all the people on that committee, but are they all men? Yeah. Regis or Rich? I mean, I don't know these people, but it looked like 10 men's names. Here, Rich, Rich will have an answer for you. Can you hear me? Oh. Deneen, would you stand up? Deneen is on our committee. <laughs> we also, I also mentioned that there were some people that were not selected but are on our committee, kind of as an ad hoc committee. There are some women on that also. Um, and to, uh, although they're not on our committee, the majority of the people that are working for T4 on our project are that just happened to be women, but anyway. We're happy to have Deneen, i got to tell you. <laughs> okay, and Bob's got the next question here. Uh, Gary Cherry, uh, Lot 2070 up on McElroy Mountain. Fourth uh, of July at the marina, the traffic was less than, than uh, wonderful. Uh, there's, I think it's obvious that there's not enough parking places there, but there was a, a really a danger because cars and trucks parked on the road between the two entrances to the marina, completely blocking a Wilderness Parkway. And in order to go out far enough to see whether there's traffic coming, your car is sticking out in the middle of the road, and I almost wiped out, or got wiped out, 
uh, there was no public safety in view. What can be done about that? And in the, the broader picture, what can be done about the parking problem? Great question. So also on our list that we'll be bringing to the board in the fall is an entire revamp of the marina parking lot. That parking lot is uh, anything but safe. You mentioned a couple of the things. I mean, first of all, the sight lines are terrible. There's two entrances and one of them you can't even see hardly out of. Uh, it's very difficult if you have any kind of handicap or just getting older. Um, it's an incredibly up, down, sideways parking lot. So one of the things uh, we have a company called Continuo Engineering is looking at a whole new plan uh, for that. And that will be taken forward to the board. John Lipkowitz, to his credit, every time I ask him, John, do you want another pontoon boat? Uh, he says, I would love another pontoon boat, but I'm not going to ask you for another pontoon boat until we fix the parking because John believes in excellent customer experience and just throwing more pontoon boats in the lake when there's nowhere for people to park and they have to park on the road or whatever is just a, a disaster waiting to happen. Um, I can't answer your question about uh, the public safety uh, situation right there. It may have been because this is the first, last, and only year that we brought the fireworks back to Pettit because of the golf course. Um, so that may have just gotten missed, but I'll let Ricky know your comments, definitely. It has been uh, <clears throat> told to me that John contacted somebody in the POA for a shuttle uh, on the 4th of July weekend, and he was turned down. Is there... Is... Yeah, I'm sorry, don't know anything about that one. I'll have to talk to John. All right, Amy, you have someone? Uh, I think I've got two, but the other people Hello. Uh, my name is Chris Baugh, and uh, I've been uh, a... Your lot number, please. Uh, uh, 3515. <laughs> <laughs> I've been a property owner here for 16 years, and uh, my wife and I are, are getting ready to build a new home, and we plan to make this our forever home. Um, thank you. But uh, I currently uh, own an Airbnb that has been uh, brought to my attention as having some issues. Um, and I want to first apologize to my neighbors, the Shaws and Dennis Dotson, uh, because I've said some things about their complaint to them that were wrong and I apologize. Um, I love Big Canoe, and, um, but I also, uh, you know, res I appreciate the opportunity to rent our home. My wife and I undergrew it um, recently. It's bigger than we need, so we're building a much smaller home. Uh, but I respect my neighbors uh, completely, although I have not displayed that. Again, I apologize. Um, I would like to continue my Airbnb rental, and I am open to the POA or the general manager or any neighbor who is, is interested or concerned, because my house is a large house and I have large groups. I would welcome you and to walk through the home and give me recommendations. Uh, I believe I have enough bedrooms. It's a very large house to rent to the group, to the number of people I, I advertise to. Um, but again, I'm welcome to ideas. I'm welcome to reducing that number. Um, I might add, I've lived on that street for 16 years, uh, immediately next door to the, ro to the Rollators, and they have never complained about any of my renters. Um, and I, I rely on them heavily uh, while we're not here to be my eyes and ears. Uh, but I want to, again, apologize to any of my neighbors that my renters have disturbed. Uh, I take it very seriously, and I will do all that I can to make sure that our neighbors feel safe and comfortable uh, and respected in, in the community. Thank you. So, so as I said before, the, the, uh, the fun thing about being a general manager is I don't 
uh, honestly cared nor uh, differentiate between my son when he's up here visiting or somebody renting a house down the street or, you know, property owners who turned it over to their kids for the weekend or whatever. The neat thing is we have a set of rules, rules and regulations and I, I don't get to be the one to decide whether they're good or bad. My job is to enforce them. So basically, all we're doing is we're the noise. We need to make sure noise doesn't cross property lines. We need to make sure cars are not out on our streets. We need to make sure that people are following the rules we hand out at the gates. And after that, I think we could all get along a lot better. So we're going we're gonna to do our part. And thank you for your comments. That was really, really good. Yes. Thank you, Chris. Bob's got the next. Well, yeah. My, uh, my name is Paul Goldstein. I live on uh, Gattaluce Pass, lot number 2231. I just want to congratulate the general manager and the board for what I deem to be the most informative and best run town hall meeting I've ever attended. <laughs> I also, I also like to make just one request. I understand that uh, we're going to be looking for a new food and beverage uh, leader, and I'd like to recommend, and I hope the rest of the group here feels the same way, that Jonathan, Jonathan should get a chance. Thank you, Paul. Amy has the next questioner. Uh, Dan Barahaw, 1228 Tanager Way. <laughs> I have a com uh, I've been here 15 years, and I have a concern about the increasing commercialization of Big Canoe. It's been my observation over those years that a lot of emphasis is placed on the amenity managers to generate a profit, which is understandable. But I think Big Canoe has to answer the basic question, are we a resort that caters to short-term guests or are we a residential community? And I think those graphs were terrific, but the one that ought to come on top of all of those and has to be answered first is which of those are we? And, uh, and our direction should follow that. And up to now, I see this inexorable push to make the uh, amenities do better and better financially that's how the managers are compensated with bonuses. So if you look at Lake Pettit, Lake Pettit on a busy day, I mean, you could walk across the lake. There are so many boats and paddle boards and sailboats, you know, where 15 years ago that wasn't the case. It was, we sort of gave the short term people Lake Sconti and Lake uh, Disharoon. And Pettit was kind of the place you could be quiet and reflect and enjoy the peace and quiet. Well, I assure you that's not the case anymore. A couple, great, great. So great question, first of all. So that, that's why when people say, why did we hire a consultant? As, as Rich said, we went out and hired somebody because we said, we got to get this right. This can't, this can't be Scott's opinion. This can't be five board members' opinions, as, as talented as they are. We really need to understand from the community how they see the next 50 years of Big Canoe evolving and what actions does that spawn, right? Because as Regis said, it all starts at the top of his chart, which is understanding the voice of the community. The board then gives me strategic direction, and I go implement with excellence. But right now, if I don't have good strategic direction, then we're sitting around in a conference room with John Lipkowitz saying, I don't know, John, what do you think? You know, I mean, that's not the way we want to run. I would tell you, though, a little bit of, of information, too. So 82% of our marina revenue comes from property owners. So John has made that amenity the most popular amenity among property owners in Big Canoe and the, you know, we're looking at doing things. We, we charge, we charge more for uh, non-property owners to, to use our amenities than you and I pay, even if we're not members of golf or something like that. So we're looking in the 2022 budget of taking that even further. 
So, you know, maybe you can't book a pontoon boat out quite as far if you're a short-term renter compared to if you're a property owner. So the direction I've given my staff as part of the budget for 2022, it's about property owner satisfaction first and make sure that your pricing, yeah. Make sure that your pricing, make sure that your wait times, make sure that your lead times, all of those policies, which we control. We don't need the state of Georgia to help us or we don't need covenant votes or anything. We, we can do that stuff. So make sure that we're favoring property owners with, with the things that we're doing because that's only fair. We bought houses here, right? So, yeah, I, I agree with you. Okay. Bob? Yeah. Bob? Bob has the next question. Oh, Regis is going to add one thing. Yeah, one, one thing in that uh, regard is a couple of years ago, uh, a previous board, and I'm not criticizing the previous board, they did what they had to do, but there was a uh, decision made to kind of emphasize outside events in our clubhouse in order to bring in revenue. These outside events are typically profitable, so it was to help mitigate the, the, the loss in the clubhouse. Earlier this year, we announced that starting in 2022, the clubhouse is not going to be open to outside weddings, um, except unless uh, to outside weddings. So if you're a property owner, you have family that you still want your daughter, your granddaughter to get married in the clubhouse, you're a property owner, that's your clubhouse, you're entitled to use it. But that's one of the things we've done. And it's kind of getting back to the voice of the community. We sensed that that's what the community wanted. But now with the survey professionally done, we will have confirmation that this is the right decision. Okay. I think Bob has the next questioner already. Yes, it's Hendrix Edgerton 5078 about the rental issue again. Uh, several years back, the leadership Big Canoe put out, I guess that was a project and made some suggestions for changes. And I believe the board uh, implemented an increase in uh, fees for rental properties, and then it was turned down by our lawyers or something like that. And just one more. Do we have a plan or should we have a plan to capture some of this revenue, this generous revenue that they're earning on their rentals in a way of a percentage, a tax? I think some of our counties are doing that now. I think Amy has studied that. I have studied this. I could write a thesis. Um, hey, Billy. <laughs> uh, you can help me. <laughs> okay, first, the fee that you were referring to, uh, we overstepped our bounds when we attempted to implement that. There was a case that came to the Georgia Court of Appeals. I've forgotten what year. Um, that that uh, affirmed that if you have purchased your home uh, under certain restrictive covenants, you're not allowed to be have them changed out from under you. And if you do, and you do not consent to do that, then you can still go back to what you were doing before. Therefore, right now, it even extended to, to increasing that fee from a one-time fee to an annual fee. It was... Um, considered by two different attorneys to be the same thing as an imposing of a further restriction of use uh, post acquisition of the property. The time to have done those things was 1972 or again in 1988 when we restated the covenants. It's just not that easy. Um, the, the tool that communities have used to be able to put any kind of restrictions post original sale is by submitting their declaration to the Georgia POA Act. Again, that's a very high bar to change any restriction of use on covenants. We can pass things on money much easier than we can pass things on restriction of use. So, you know, one of the things that the GovDoc uh, committee was studying is should we submit ourselves to the Georgia POA Act? We don't have their final recommendations yet. But if it is included to be one and the board decides to go ahead with that, it's put up for a property owner vote. And that's the two-thirds of every single person in this community has to vote to do that. But even that doesn't place restrictions. We still have to take another step and write other restrictions. So that is one of the things that the Strategic Planning Committee is going to be attempting to find out is what is the will of the community. But just know it's a very complicated 
long process. Uh, it'll be an interesting one for the community to go through together, so we're not going to undertake this lightly. But to circle back to that final fee question, it was deemed right in the category of restriction of use, and you just can't play around with it. There's a lot of things we can't do that would have been a great idea if we'd started it in 1972. She's got another one waiting back there. Thank you. Hi, I'm Linda Fearman. I live at 1087 Cardinal Cove. We built our home 20 years ago. We're part-timers. Uh, so first, I would like to echo Paul's sentiments that this is an extremely well-run town hall. And let me also say congratulations to Shiraz for a very well-deserved reward. And the personification of community here in Big Canoe. Thank you. Um, I know some of the members on the board. The others are probably familiar with my name because of my nonstop correspondence regarding returning to live meetings. I am not naive enough to think that if we return to live board meetings, you will not have 80 comment threads on neighbor to neighbor about any particular issue. That will always continue, but maybe it'll get down to about 20 or 25. I did hear something today that sparked my interest, and that was the idea that board members would be present on Thursdays prior to the meetings. I didn't quite understand that, so if I could get a clarification, that would be welcome. Thank you. Do you, Candace, you want that? Do you want sure. Okay. Sure. Um, <clears throat> yes, that, that's an opportunity the Thursday before the regular meeting to come and ask any questions, open up discussion for the board to share what their thoughts are. Right now in 2021, just open up to our regular board meetings, the uh, audiovisual in, in the rooms that we've been having that in the past years is just very poor. And while it's recorded, uh, we've gotten enough feedback and we've gotten just a ton more people that uh, see on YouTube or whatever after our board meeting that actually watch us. Where with the AV as it was, uh, live meetings and those that couldn't attend because the room was you know, fa fairly small, the audiovisual was so poor from that meeting that you really couldn't really hear everything that a board member or someone that was... Uh, coming to ask a question. We're certainly not discouraging questions at all. And you know we have that for our, um, our, our Zoom meetings where we have Tim, who, and we invite questions in uh, at the end of our meeting. And um, those have been taken. Sometimes we only have three or four, sometimes we've had 14 or 15. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, in the clubhouse. Yeah, pr probably in the room that we've had our regular board meetings in the yeah. past. So if y'all remember, we used to do uh, what we call work meetings the Thursday before the board yeah. meetings. This is kind of what that is. We don't need a formal meeting because we always did our votes in right. the, the formal board meeting itself, not the work meeting. So this is just really kind of bringing the old work meeting back, but in just a more relaxed yeah, uh, atmosphere much more. for people to yeah. just come by. Okay, okay. we'll announce just through Inside the Gates newsletter those dates and be in the Mountains View room. And that information will be coming out shortly. Okay. So come to dinner, go to the bar afterwards, just, yeah. just like we used to. So. All right, and we have Meg up here, I think. Amy? Meg Rooney, Lot 2066, Scott. Um, you said that all property owners pay a discounted rate from non-property owners at our amenities. So how is that done in the clubhouse? So the clubhouse is the one place that actually does function today like a restaurant. So we all pay the same in, in, in the clubhouse. So thanks for saying that. So yeah, sometimes it's funny. Sometimes we think of the clubhouse as an amenity and sometimes we don't, but yes. So obviously we all pay the same rate. Um, you know, part of the budget, we kind of keep looking at other other models for the clubhouse. Um, you know, maybe there's uh, some different structures, but at least at the moment, we all pay the same rate in the clubhouse. Every other amenity 
There is a different rate for members. If you join the golf amenity as a member, you're paying, you're getting a discount fee. I can go play nine holes today if I could get a tee time, and I would pay more. And then somebody could, if they could possibly get a tee time, that was a, a visitor would come in and pay again more on top of that. So we will be looking at all those fees as part of the budget. Bob, you have any over on your side? We've been neglecting you. Uh, Bob Baird, 2456. Uh, quick question that I probably know the answer to, but I'll ask it to the group. Are we going to get to the point where we can, I'm all for weddings. I've done it a couple times myself. But the, the, the question is, are we going to are we gonna be able to have weddings and not close the clubhouse as part of the redo of the clubhouse? So those are two different questions there, Bob. Um, the first one is the clubhouse needs to be redone for the property owners first to be able to serve nice dinners and things and have folks walk in and have a nice meal and stuff while we're having good time over here, while acoustic showcase is meeting, while there's a dance band out there, all of that kind of stuff. So that's point one. What we do with that clubhouse after we do that change then becomes a strategy decision again about are we opening up the community for more outside events? Yes, they generate money. The best thing, if, if, if you're in food and beverage, uh, if you talk to Bobby Jones or any Troon, anybody else, there's a saying you basically buy the food once and you sell it twice when you basically host a wedding because the margins are terrific, which is why, as Regis said, why we started in the past saying, yeah, let's do property, you know, let's do uh, business meetings, let's do weddings and all that kind of stuff. So clubhouse needs to be fixed for us so that we use the space well. What we do with that then, to me, comes out of the strategic planning team. Okay, Amy. Hi, good afternoon. Jerry Wirchaluk, lot 6066. You know, in the last couple of days, uh, I noticed some COVID relief money uh, surrounding us to the tune, I think, of $15 million for Pickens County that maybe they knew they were getting, maybe they did not. I haven't heard the amount for Dawson County, but I just wonder, do we, we're sitting here and we, we're in such wonderful position relative to capital improvements um, and moving forward in the future, but is there an opportunity for us being so important to Dawson and to Pickens County to maybe solicit, uh, maybe raise our hand and say, don't forget about us because we could use some of those funds? Just, a, just an idea. Thank you, Jerry. I'm sure they'd love to hear uh, from us on that. <laughs> it's a great idea, though. I like it. Yeah, I think they could they could subsidize our fire department too, but that's a whole other topic as well. Um, yeah, so so uh, you know we we continue to work with those uh, those two communities. I would say that uh, Chris Stansel has been awesome in his position uh, at Pickens. Some of those uh, improvements to keep people from hitting my roundabout have become uh, because we asked Chris and he took care of it. Um, it gets a little harder when you start saying, can you give us some of your money? Um, I have a feeling that probably wouldn't go too far, but um, we uh, can always ask, Bob. Let's ask. I hope you can hear me. I'm a little hoarse. Yes. Miller, Miller Andrus, lot 3221. Uh, several years ago, maybe more recently than that, uh, there was an initiative by the board to do local neighborhood improvements. That is, cutting the grass more, uh, trimming things up. That seems to have disappeared. Is there a current program? So in the, in the budget guidance this year, um, there's a couple things we do here that don't make much sense to me. So one, <laughs> just a couple. Um, one of the things is uh, we don't uniformly take care of some of our neighborhood common property. 
So, for example, we might say to people, oh, we'll bring out the pine straw, but you guys get to spread it yourself. <laughs> and I'm just like, that's kind of interesting because that's, you know, that, that, that turnaround is common property. So anyway, again, in the budget cycle, I've put a, a few things that I've learned in the last year. And I've said, hey, guys, I want you to assess what the cost of doing it. If we put property owner satisfaction at the top, there's some money there, there's some labor there, there's some materials there. I bundle all that together, I take it to my, my five friends to my left, and, and you know the, the budget cycle along with the finance committee is a pretty long cycle, and that's where we decide all those things. But uh, I don't disagree with uh, some of what you're saying there. Project in mind, would you welcome our submittal? Would you welcome if he has a specific? If, yeah, absolutely. Project. Always, always. Just use uh, the best way to always get hold of me is use ask the POA. If it goes directly into my email, it may die. Um, so please use ask the POA. Just send it. It'll come to me. I check them every day. All right, Amy, you have someone. Lynn Knapp, six one zero one Indian Pipe. Uh, first of all, I want to thank Scott and Candace in particular, and the rest of the board about uh, listening to my husband and I on, on the rental issue. My question is, looking ahead in the future, can we put a cap on the number of rentals we have in the community, like 15% or something like that? That's Amy. The short answer is yes. The long answer is it will take a long time and a lot of people to have the will to do that. It goes back to what we were just talking about with changing the covenants. It requires a covenant change. So I, I won't take everybody through that process again, but it's very complicated, very lengthy, and the vast majority of everyone here has to have an opinion, and it has to be yes. The, the short answer to all those things is any restriction that we impose on folks that currently don't have that r restriction and are renting their homes is a covenant change. And again, you have to decide if the community wants that, how much of the community wants that, and can we get a vote that says that's the right thing to do. And that's what I said at the beginning, the board doesn't decide that, we decide that. Well, and even if we did an immediate covenant change and we had enough people that wanted it, anybody who voted no doesn't have to abide by it unless we're part of the Georgia POA Act. percentage in our community versus others? Yeah, yeah. Actually, I think Scott talked about this at a board, last month's board meeting. We found about 250 different rental units, and we have 2,759, could be more than that now, finished homes. So it's, it's still less than 10%. All right. Let me see if anybody else, since you've had one shot. <laughs> okay. I think, okay. I think you've got else? behind you, Amy. Okay. I'm, I'm Billy Smith. My lot number is one zero four one zero four three five. Uh, I'd like to, you know, address this rental short-term issue just shortly to lay a bug. I've been one of these folks in the last few weeks that has really reached out to the board. Scott, you and I had a meeting day before yesterday, and you didn't show up. I've talked to Regis a number of times. Let's have both sides of this issue to discuss these things. This lady here just mentioned you had granted her meetings. I represent 400 people that do rent property and have the right to rent property anytime we choose to do so. Folks that don't like that, you shouldn't have bought in here in the first place because this has been a part of this community from the beginning. So all I'm saying is, is I feel like this is going to be a really polarizing issue as these things come up regarding the uh, Georgia POA Act and what we might do. I'm one that seeks solutions. I don't want the problems. I got in the middle of this gentleman right here last week and the gentleman up there that he was referring to 
and I learned that that problem could have been so easily evolved, uh, resolved if people had just spoken up and talked about it. All I want to leave with you guys is we really need to have some forums like this where we just discuss rentals. If you have to put a blue panel together to talk about it, let's all get together because I'm okay either way. I can go private club or rentals, whatever. But we're not talking about it when you're talking with just one side of this issue, and that needs to stop. Just to clear the record, I actually talk to both sides of the issue all the time, and unfortunately that meeting, I told Regis I couldn't attend. So I'll meet with you. Honestly, I don't ever blow off my meetings, trust me. So, and like I said before, and I meant what I said, this to me is about enforcement. I don't care why you're here. I really don't. So, you know, I'm leaving this to the strategic planning committee. I'm leaving this to the board. My job is to uniformly enforce the rules and regulations of Big Canoe. And that's what I'm going to do. And I need, as I said before, everybody's help through public safety to let us know if there's a violation uh, going on. Because I think if we are successful in doing that, a lot of this will calm down. Because we don't always know whether the person who's making the noise next door is, is a renter or friends of the family. All we care about is are they making the noise. Okay, next question is back. Bob? Jim Billmeyer, 2796. We talked about rentals a lot. Could you clarify the rights of the timeshare owners in here relative to the rental issues? Thank you. I am not an expert on timeshares, but, and they are definitely a different animal. Billy, if you've got anything to say. <laughs> but, yeah. Okay. Okay, all right. But basically, it's hard to know when you could have 52 different owners in, a, in one timeshare who's an owner, who isn't an owner. And so they, basically they are treat, they are owners and they do get treated as owners. And unfortunately the people, sometimes they trade out their ownership and go somewhere else. So we don't, we don't know the difference. They're treated as owners. Can All right, I'm still on first questions. You, first questions, uh, Amy behind you. First questions, Amy behind you. First okay. questions behind you. Behind me, I've got to go to that. <laughs> okay. Yeah, uh, Kurt Hochstetter, lot uh, 9087. And my question is about the, the roads. Uh, when we moved in seven years ago, we were told that uh, our, our neighborhood, our street was next, and it still hasn't been taken care of. We've got uh, 11 patches on our road in less than a half mile stretch. And you know, I saw recently that there's other parts of Big Canoe that they're much newer than our area that have recently been repaved. So just wondering uh, when you're gonna get to equestrian and how those decisions are made. So, great question. So, basically, the way it works is every year we have a gentleman named Dr. Watson, no relation to Sherlock Holmes, who comes out and he is a paving road uh, engineer and he rides 88 miles of roads with our public safety staff and every segment of every road gets graded and then we look and, and just like a lot of big canoe, uh, stuff had been neglected for a while. So, uh, my understanding is about three, four years ago, there was a very high percentage of roads that were rated as poor. Um, that is now very small percentage. We spend, this year we spent $1.1 million on roads. It's our single highest capital expense. But we also then overlay on top of that, what is AEMC, what's the electric company doing to our roads, and what is Utilities Inc. doing to our roads. Because guess what? Both of those infrastructures are also 50 years old. And we all know what's going on with Utilities, Inc. And 
AEMC is spending a lot of investment here too. And so Equestrian, your road, I know, I got it. I know right where it is, um, is rated as one of the ones that I would say is poor. The problem is we can't pave it yet because they're not done tearing it up. So the problem is we have to wait till AEMC, you know, we, and we don't, own them, just like we don't own Utilities, Inc., we can influence them, and we try to do that all the time, believe me, but they got to get done their work first, then your road's next. So. Okay, are we through with first questions? Yeah, I want to make sure everybody got, you want to say first Everybody first got in their first question? First question. Okay, let's do follow-ups. Okay. Hi, Chris Ball again, lot 3515. Um, I just wanted to, to say along short-term rentals that I respect everyone's opinion. Um, I lived in Macon, Georgia, born and raised my whole life, middle Georgia for those of you who know it. And my neighbor in 2005 said, hey, we bought a home in Big Canoe. You ought to check it out. Never heard of Big Canoe, and I live in Macon. Uh, so they gave us their house uh, as, a, as a renter, gave us a nice discount. And uh, we came up on a Thursday, and we fell in love with Big Canoe immediately, and we bought our home on Monday. We bought our first home. And we would have never even known about Big Canoe had we not been a short-term renter. Um, my wife and I got married in this very chapel over 10-plus years ago. We would have never known about this chapel had I not stayed here as a short-term renter. Uh, I do not think short-term rentals are evil. Uh, I do think that they, should, they need to be controlled, uh, and I think each owner who owns a short-term rental should take it very seriously, uh, controlling their their guest. Um, and I, I guess that's all I have to say. But the other thing, I'll just 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 to comment: um, if you stayed here as a short-term renter when you were looking for a house or building a house or just come here and discovered it like I did and fell in love, and now you are against short-term renters, that makes no sense to me. If you ever stayed here as a short-term renter and now you're voting or you're, you know, you're turned off by them, just ask yourself, well, how did I discover Bickenu? Okay, do we have any questions? All right. It's about 12.30. And we thank you very much for your attendance and enjoy Big Canoe. Thank you. Good job. Good job. Good job. Hey. You are never about to talk. You are here for the rest of your life. Sure. Yeah.